now, please join me in welcoming Jaron Lanier and James Bridal. Good evening. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Welcome to Conway Hall. Um, if you've never been here before, Conway Hall is part of one of the uh, oldest surviving free-thinking organizations in the world, uh, which makes it a pretty um, uh, appropriate place, I think, for tonight's conversation. It should be entertaining. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you to the School of Life for organizing this. Uh, and particularly, thank you to Jaron for being with us here this evening. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, both from Cathy's introduction and from whatever else you might know in the past. Um, Jaron is a computer scientist, uh, a musician, as you can see from the objects arrayed on the stage with us here. Um, he's an artist and he's an author. Um, his book, Manifesto, You Are Not a Gadget, which was published in 2010, um, criticized the glorification of, of the collective over individuals, over individual creativity and individual agency, and, and particularly criticized the way that uh, that glorification is, of, is often encoded into uh, the digital technologies, digital structures that we're building, both in kind of very large corporate settings and in some of the internet sort of more radical uh, libertarian projects. Um, his new book, uh, Who Owns the Future, continues to investigate many of these themes and that's what we're discussing tonight, both, both kind of his view of what's happening in the world and, and what, what might be done about it. Um, but before getting into that, um, Jaron would like to start with some music, so over to you. Yeah, hey, thanks for coming out. Uh, <laughs> it's so funny having these sort of lounge chairs on stage, I just kind of feel like spacing out. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm in this weird position of talking about the, you know, the future of the digital political economy and all that, but also playing weird instruments when I do it. Somehow it all works. So I'm going to start with, uh, how many of you have heard me play this? You know, this is from Laos, it's called a can. I'll play a little bit of this and then we'll talk about the ideas. There's a wonderful story about that instrument, which maybe I'll, if, you can ask me about it in the questions if you remember, and maybe I'll tell you a tale about that. There's a good argument that this is the, the ancient uh, invention of binary numbers and the digital idea, actually, but it's true, it's true. <laughs> it's the oldest known um, combinatorial binary um, object representation that has happened in humanity. But anyway, let's get to the new book. Um, all right. <laughs> can I ask? I will, what? Can I ask? You can ask me questions. Sure. Uh, right. Well, no, but it's particularly because of the, your interest in the musical instruments and stuff kind of uh, is one of the themes that runs through several of your books. And like your background in a whole range of areas, music, but also in, in computers, is kind of mm -hmm. one of the things that forms it. And I was particularly interested in, um, the, as well as in your interest in virtual reality, which is one of the kind of earlier formation 
parts of your of your areas of interest. Uh -huh. How does how does music and virtual reality and things like that form the background to the kind of ideas that we'll we'll be bringing I, in? I've never had an answer to that question. It's just the stuff I do. But <laughs> honestly, I mean, I wish I had. I could spin all kinds of lies about it. That would be really entertaining. But in, in truth, I just find myself doing these things. But respectfully, could I could I introduce the new book as a start? And Go then, ahead. Because I just I'd like to dive into that since we only have a, an hour, and I just want to. Um, so. Um, here, uh, to, to start to explain the new book, let me, let me uh, take you back about 30 years. It's more than 30 years, 32 or 33 years. And um, I was part of a circle of young technical people who were uh, just on fire and enthused about what we were doing with computers. And we could see already this very strange property of computation, which is sometimes known as Moore's Law, um, uh, and it's known in various ways, but the idea is that you, you, computers are gonna keep on getting cheaper, so therefore, there'll be just more and more of them doing more and more things, more and more connected. So you can sort of see this weird inverse funnel where every little thing you do will be expanded and multiplied. And so back then, we could see that that was gonna happen. And there were these crazy discussions, like if there are billions of little computers, where will they be? In doorknobs? That was a joke once, and they actually did turn up already decades ago in doorknobs and hotels and so forth, and they just would, they would pervade everywhere. Um, and so in the context of that realization, there was this sort of sense of, wow, you know, the world's gonna change with this stuff, how should it change? And there were a number of really interesting ideas in play. The very earliest one started before the year I was born, actually, 1960, the very first person to articulate this was Ted Nelson, who articulated one concept of networks. Um, and to get to the punchline, I believe he turns out to be right. But during the 70s and 80s, a countervailing concept came up, which is the one that's become um, an orthodox dominant concept now. It's the one expressed by the pirate parties, and it's the one that's just beaten into us every day by almost every digital pundit, it seems. And this is the idea that information should be free, that, there sh that culture should be open. And uh, uh, so <laughs> uh, under, under this scheme, people share, the networks gets all this information, everybody's supposed to benefit. Now, I don't want to just talk forever, so I want to hear, but the, 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 the very, very quick version of the book is that I came to realize from just observing the results that we totally blew it, and that's completely wrong. And the reason it's wrong is incredibly simple, that not all computers are created equal. Whoever owns the biggest computer on an open network gets to out-calculate everybody else and becomes the spy master who can organize everyone else to their advantage. And it doesn't matter if that spy master is actually called the spy master, if it's a national intelligence agency, or if it's a finance scheme that forces austerity on the world, or if it's Google or Facebook or Microsoft or any of the other companies. It's all exactly the same game, and it's not a sustainable game, and we need to switch to a different one. So that's the summary of the book. Whew. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> in the in the book, you um, you come up with this term for for these various systems or uh -huh. objects that are collecting up all this information and, and doing something with them, which is siren servers. Mm -hmm. um, and you've you've mentioned a whole bunch of examples there. Could you give us kind of one example of of a siren server in action? Why why you chose that name for it, and and what it's doing, and how it's affecting the world? Ah, sure. It was really hard to come up with a name, and I still don't think it's perfect. I went through a bunch of names. They were master servers for a while, and they had some other names, but Siren Server alliterates, so it seems okay at least. Um, so um, I think a good place to start is what happened in finance. So uh, financiers discovered computation uh, in the 80s, more or less. I mean, big network computation. Um, uh, and what happens when you have the biggest computer on an open network is you're suddenly presented with outrageous advantages that you couldn't even have planned on or anticipated. So uh, what started to happen initially in the 80s and then in the 90s a little bit more, and then recently even more, is that um, you, you, you have the giant computer, you gather data from everybody, and you say, hey, I'll just calculate the perfect investment. I'll, I'll calculate the perfect scheme. I can predict enough and I can understand enough of what's going on that I can radiate all the risk and loss out to other people. So uh, some of the examples, well, there were some early ones. There was a thing called Enron, you might remember, and something called Long-Term Capital. Remember those guys? Those were the test runs. Uh, 
And, uh, and then the, the, the current wave of austerity was precisely caused by people sort of getting even better at this. And the problem with it, this sort of confounding thing, is uh, as I describe in the book, I know a lot of the folks who are involved in creative, creating these, and I don't think they're bastards. I don't think they're creeps. I think what it is is that having the biggest computer on an open network provides you with such a huge temptation that it just it's almost impossible not to just go with the flow. And so you, you calculate your perfect investment and um, it, you know the, the metaphor I like to use uh, is uh, Maxwell's demon, the old teaching tool for thermodynamics. So do you all know Maxwell's demon? Remember it? So if you go and you take a, uh, an intro to thermodynamics class, you'll, you'll meet the demon. And the demon is an imaginary creature who's, who's uh, standing by a little door, and if a hot molecule comes by the door, it opens the door and the hot molecule goes in, and if it's a cold molecule, it keeps the door closed, and after a while, it's separated out the hot and the cold, and then it just lets them run back together and turn a turbine, and then it repeats and creates a perpetual motion machine. Sounds great, doesn't it? And the reason it, it doesn't work, the reason there's no free lunch, is that the very act of discrimination requires power. The very act of memory storage to calculate whether a particle is hot or cold requires power. And so the power to run the door radiates enough waste heat to undo the scheme, right? And so by the same token, all the air conditioners in a hot city make the city hotter, even if they might make a few rooms colder, right? Um, this is the no free lunch principle. And so far as we know, it's inviolable. And so what you're doing, when you have the biggest computer in the network, you get the illusion that you can violate that principle because you can calculate your perfect investment, but it means radiating out, outward risk and loss to everybody else. And you sort of imagine there's this infinite sized planet that can absorb it all, but it can't. And then you need your bailout and the government goes into austerity. It's, and it, it's exactly the same process. And, and so in the book, what I propose is that the current austerity that's the result of real estate manipulations is the precise mirror, what we'd call an isomorphism in mathematics, to what happened to the music business with open sharing and Pirate Bay and all that. That this principle, um, this principle benefits, you know, it, it gives you quick treats at first, like the people who got bad mortgages at first thought they were getting the greatest deal of their lives, an easy cheap mortgage or a free music file. But it's part of a process in which a big computer is perfecting its game at the expense of society at a whole until it breaks. So and this is a principle that you identify not happening just in the kind of big shadowy worlds of finance, but kind of in, in the tools that we use every day in terms of social services like Google and Facebook. They're employing the same very large systems of, of data gathering and this kind of privileged access to data to, to do what? What are, they, what are they gaining from us in return? Well, so the way I see it, what happened in finance should serve as a cautionary tale for computation in general. So um, in terms of why worry about free, uh, free search and free social networking, um, there's some short-term reasons to worry, but the bigger reasons are longer term. So um, in, in, uh, it's funny, I help make up the rhetoric about how great free music is. Like, you know, when people talk about, oh, but you can go play live gigs and it's better and you're freed from labels and everything. I really made up a lot of that stuff. I really know it. I'm, I'm not like some old guy who doesn't get it. <laughs> you know, and the problem I saw with it is that it's not so much that you can't make any money as a musician in a world of, of, of open copying of music files, you know, as is often pointed out, you can still sell tickets to gigs and all that. The problem is that you're forced into an informal economy in what I call a real-time life. So you have to sing for your supper for every meal. And it's a, it's, a, it's a way of life that might you might do well once in a while if you're one of the lucky few, but you will never be able to sustain a serious illness, uh, raise children or a sick child especially. Like it doesn't, it doesn't prepare you for the contingencies of life because it's only income, it's not wealth. It's not, there's, no, there's no momentum behind it. But does that apply to, to all of us then? I mean, when someone just signs into Facebook or uses Google search, how are they, what's the value of the, the labor essentially that they're, well, they're committing there? The problem will become more serious as they, as they get older in like 10 or 20 years. And specifically, here's, here's I think where it'll become very serious. Going way back to the 19th century, there's been a trope that has never proven true, which is that automation should kill employment, right? That was the Luddite dilemma. That's what motivated early, early Karl Marx writing and so forth. And the, it, it motivated the start of the science fiction genre with H.G. Wells, Time Machine, and all that. And I mean, so this has been this underlying fear, and it just hasn't ever panned out. We've, we've tended to end up with 
better jobs, as technology gets better. But the thing is, this, this ideal that we mistakenly committed ourselves to could actually make that trope true. And, and the reason why is simple. The more automation there is, um, the more the, inf the economy has to become an information economy, because that's what's left. And if we say information has to be free, it means that the economy will shrink. I mean, it, you know, and that's, that sounds overly simplistic, and, and it can be stated much more carefully, but I believe that fundamentally that dilemma is quite real. And so, you know, the kinds of automation we can expect are taxis and trucks driving themselves to a large degree, throwing drivers out of work. We can expect manufacturing uh, to become much less labor intensive, intensive, whether it's 3D printers or other things, um, and, and, and on and on. And there, there are demonstrations every day of white collar jobs, educated jobs being uh, doable by, by software. Uh, now, now, the trick is that every time software can do something that people used to do, it's due to what we call big data. And big data is just the massive contributions of everybody on the net in disguise. So like, you know, like one example I've used is um, to perform automatic translation in cloud services. Um, all the tr real translations, by, or the in initial translations by real people are gathered together and then your new translation is correlated with those because there's a, a lot of little sub-examples that can then be mashed together to create a, a plausible translation. So artificial intelligence on, on a network or big data is just a way of disenfranchising or anonymizing people. That it's precisely the same thing. Uh, I mean, sometimes the algorithms are good, but fundamentally it's a rehashing of data from people. And by demonetizing all of that data, uh, the more automation becomes important, the more the economy will shrink. So basically, every time you use Facebook, you're reducing your employment prospects for the future. It's a gradual, no, no, I mean, that shouldn't sound funny. I mean, that's actually a fact, it's just gradual. You're killing your future drip by drip. How is that kind of, that accumulation of, of um, information and, and the wealth that flows from it? How, I mean, you said that the, the, this kind of, the, the echoes of, of Luddism or the, uh -huh. the fears of automation stuff have kind of been present with us for, for, for as long as there's been any form of automation. How is what the sort of siren servers and what Google and Facebook are doing fundamentally different to kind of previous capitalist excesses like the Industrial Revolution or the enclosures or? Yeah, uh, it's a great, it's an interesting question because um, uh, there is this question of how much is really new and how much isn't. And I think there's a case to be made that uh, some of what I'm talking about is not all that different from what happened towards the end of the 19th century or in the run-up to the Great Depression and so forth. Um, in, in a sense, I, I'm not a historian and I, I can't tease that out entirely. I do believe there are some similarities and some differences. One of the differences is the sort of arm's length cleanliness of the new way of doing it. I mean, like I think the old way of being um, a bad banker, let's say, was a little bit more deliberate than the new way of being a bad banker. Because you can accumulate extraordinary, extraordinary wealth to the point of damaging the economy as a whole without intending to. It's almost like this automatic arm's length sort of a thing because you are just given such, a, such advantages because you have the best computation. So I think, um, I think the difference now versus then is really a lack of bad intent. You know, it's, it, it almost happens automatically. And I say that from direct experience of knowing some of the people involved. And now, maybe it was like that in the past, but my, my sense from reading history is that it was not. So this is an intentionality that's almost been built in by accident into the software that's kind of performing this irrespective of human intention? Yeah, I, well, I mean, sometimes there's, it, it, it varies, you know, but um, I like, uh, I think maybe Facebook was intending to play the game, but Google wasn't, because I was there, I remember it, and it, that, that actually, uh, no, like people, people thought it would be big, but nobody understood exactly what the mechanism would be. And I think, you know, theory can only predict so much. I think we have to learn empirically by watching this happen a number of times to see the pattern. And, but the, the problem as it stands now is, is, like, there are people inside Google who are aware that, that this is a problem, and Google talks a lot about, and I don't want to single out Google, but it's the example we'll, we'll use for the moment, is they, you make a, a, a lot of talk of being open and, and not being evil, but a lot of what they do remains kind of totally invisible and protected well, look, by corporate One secrets. of the things that I, I really want to be very clear about is that um, I don't believe in the doctrine of the bad people and the good people. So um, I'm not willing to dump on Google. I'm, I mean, I, sure. among other things, I sold them a startup, um, and yet, and to make things even, and they're friends, you know, and to make things even more complicated, uh, as a researcher, I'm a member of Microsoft's labs, and Microsoft does all the same stuff. So 
I'm totally part of this, and I, I don't think there's this class of bad people, you know, and I, um, it's a little tricky because sometimes to get people to communicate a problem, the human mind is so clan-oriented, clan you want to identify, okay, it's those bad people, you know, those are the bad ones. And I think in this case, it's more of a pattern problem than a bad class of people. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of what Google does really sucks, but it's, it's true for, exa for me, you know, that's, I'm talking about myself, I'm not talking about some mysterious dark other. Sure, but if we're talking about a, um, a series of um, kind of things that have, that have been built into these systems kind of from the ground up, quite possibly by accident, then it requires mm -hmm. some kind of intervention to, to, to change the course of this. Ah, that that's the book. This is, this is, where, this is, this is where, <laughs> yes. where you start to go with the book, <laughs> that you recognize that there's been some kind of fundamental architectural errors into the, the software you've built. And, and you, as you mentioned already, you kind of identified that, uh, that, that there were previous better potentials for the internet in, in the work of someone like Ted Nelson. Yeah. Where, where, uh, at what point did it go wrong? Why, why did we go down this wrong path? And, 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 and at what point did you get, become really uncomfortable with it? Okay, well, I think we went wrong in the 70s, and it happened in a strange way. Part of it was the, the Internet was born in sort of two communities. Um, one was a sort of a government military complex, and another was universities, which at that time was hippies very much, and so you could say it was sort of a right-left collaboration. And so um, in, uh, in the United States, um, where the, the initial internet start was, uh, started to work, um, the, the people on the, the right wing or sort of military side were deeply upset in the 70s about something that seems kind of petty at this point, but it was a huge cause celebre, which was uh, the, the, uh, a, 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 a a fixed speed limit on the highways to conserve oil because there had been an oil embargo and so forth. And so to counter that, there was this thing called Citizens Band Radio, which was, the, which was sort of the, the Twitter of its era or something. It was, it was more present in the culture probably than Twitter is today. There were songs about it on the radio. It was like the, this huge thing. It's hard to imagine now. <clears throat> and so what happened is um, people would, would use this radio while they were driving to tell each other where the police were hiding so that they could speed. And in order to do that, they, ha they had to make up fake handles so that they wouldn't be arrested. And so this created this idea that anonymity is the cool thing and this kind of open, anonymous, untraceable network is the cool thing. Meanwhile, in the university side, I hardly need to explain why they were interested in exactly the same idea. Um, uh, it was a uh, draft. Uh, Towards the, in the beginning, the draft was still active, although it ended soon, but people were still scared of it. So part of it was trying to um, separate from society because people were terrified of Vietnam and that it might renew. And uh, the other thing was drugs. I mean, I, I, I distinctly remember one of the earliest computers on the internet, also ser its waste heat was, uh, was serving a pot farm illicitly in the basement of a major university's computer science lab. Um, and, and no, I will not state which one, <laughs> but uh, this sort of stuff went on. So um, there was this sort of fantasy that what it means to be empowered as a young technical person is to be able to escape the view of the man, of, the, of this central authority, which is the fantasy that drove the idea of the open, that's, that's what drove this idea that <coughs> anonymity and being able to do things without a trace is one and the same as Liberty Online. And it all made sense at the time. It all seemed to be correct. Uh, like I say, this was, I, I don't think anybody could have predicted how it would play out. And then you asked, when I started to feel uncomfortable, I can, I mean, there were a couple of distinct moments. Um, when I was uh, in the 90s, I had a, uh, <coughs> a little startup company that Enron wanted to buy, and I started to talk to those guys, and I got really creeped out. They were just, no, there, there, there were some bad people, actually. That was, that was bad. And they were using networks in such a horrible way, and it just disturbed me terribly. And then um, that company ended up going to Google, and then I started to watch Google grow, and I started to realize, wait a second, I love the people at Google, but they're actually doing the same stuff that everyone was doing. They're just doing with this, you know, they don't realize they're, they're doing it, you know? And, um, but the thing that really got to me, that really got me in the gut was, uh, <coughs> I'd spent so many years 
proclaiming how horrible it was to have to be to be stuck with a label and a recording contract if you're a musician and how wonderful it would be to just directly give your music away and all that and then what i saw happening is when uh, my musician friends some of whom were very famous and beloved would just get ill or have some issue come up and suddenly their income went away and they we, we would have to organize benefits so they could get their operation or something remember in the u.s we haven't had health insurance so everybody lives on the edge and uh um it just hit me so hard that we'd made a mistake because we were actually hurting the people on the ground we were intending to help. Now, of course, if you were 20 and you just wanted to run around in a stinky van doing gigs and promote it online, great, that works great. But it doesn't work for a life cycle. Um, so if, if, if we have these kind of couple of these twin desires, which is this kind of desire for anonymity and this mm -hmm. desire for kind of uh, things being free, whether that's experience, whether it's music or uh, any of those things, those are the things that then uh, powerful things, powerful servers, the siren servers that you talk about in the mm -hmm. book, can come along and, and, and basically secretly make their own profits off without returning anything back to the people who've, who've generated that. And we've kind of given them that power through demanding... Well, you know, what, what happens free. more precisely, they do give a little bit back, but they give back um, a, a token amount. So what happens is with every single one of these schemes, there's some people who interact with them who do very well. And to me, this is the equivalent of what in the 19th century was called the Horatio Alger story. So there are always a token few people who do very well with their YouTube videos, who do very well with their... Um, whatever it is, their Kickstarter campaigns or something. But the, the thing about it is for society to work and for society to remain democratic, the economic outcomes for people have to be distributed with sort of a mound, like a bell curve, or at least some approximation, so that the, some large bulk of people can outspend the elite. Otherwise, democracy falters. And, uh, and we've seen that again and again. And people who interact with this scheme, some of them do well, but the distribution is instead one of these sharp curves where there's the, the so-called long tail and then this, this token peak. And, and that's a democracy destroyer. And is, is this something that only applies to, to creative people, people who are supplying music or videos or who, who are kind of uh, uh, entertaining in some way? Or well, are there other forms of contributing or, or being cheated of that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, for now, it's the creative people or the people, you know, but, but when the cars drive themselves and, uh, and, and your electronics are printed out, you know, when, when labor starts to go away potentially, culture should be monetized to make up the difference so that we can still have an economy. The only alternative would be some sudden rush into socialism, and socialism in the context of these siren servers would be really bad. I, I really don't want a socialist committee that's also the, the master spy business. You know, I think I think that would that's exactly how socialism has failed in the past, and that failure would be amplified. So, I think socialism has to be off the table in the information age. Um, so, you know, just it just won't work. I mean, it just gives it just uh, because computers aren't created equal, people are, but not computers. I'd like to come back in a bit to that kind of idea of yeah. both of socialism and of, um, and, of, and of the kind of the types of uh, contributions that people can make, whether creative or otherwise. Uh -huh. but, um, but let's turn to, in the book, what you propose as some sort of corrective measures for yeah, the yeah. system that we've built now. So uh, do you want to outline briefly just a, a couple of the measures in the, mm -hmm. that you outline in the book that would sure. address well, this? Sure. Um, there are a variety of them, and some of them have to do with the architecture of digital networks, and some of them get just a little technical, um, and, and some of them are just simple. So um, the simplest idea is counter to the most popular idea, the idea of the, pi the pirate parties and so many other idealist uh, enterprises now, and um, that's to make information worth something, to make it be paid. And what I need to say about this is that um, I think it's absurd to go around to people who are copying music files and scold them and say, oh, you mustn't copy that music file because of copyright or something. And the reason why is that currently there's no reciprocity. Those very same people are being spied by cameras every time they walk on the street. Every device they use is logging data about them. Every single thing they do is going into databases that will affect their future credit and all that. And so all this information is being taken from them that really affects them. And they're not paid for that information. And now we're going to complain about them copying a music file. So in the context of that incredible imbalance, I, I, don't think you, I don't think it's easy, at least, to argue that they should be forbidden from, from copying the music file. However, if there was a case where they were being paid for, for information as it's used that turns out to be valuable because of their existence, um, 
that's a different story. Then I think there could be a new social contract where they don't mind paying for the information for the very simple reason that the system they're paying into also provides for their own wealth and sustenance and the well-being of, of their, their life, you know, and, their, and, um, and uh, let me give you <clears throat> one example of why I think this idea would bring enough benefits even to bring around the sort of radical left that, that might initially resist it the most. Um, Right now, when you walk in the streets of London, there's an army of little cameras that are following your every move. Machine vision is good enough to track you, so we're all being tracked all the time. And this is kind of nuts, because we have fought very, very hard wars precisely to avoid systems in which people are being spied on all the time. And we might imagine today that the people who run the spy agencies or the tech companies or our, or our bankers are lovely, sweet, young people. Um, whatever you think of them, the point is, who knows who will be in that position in the future? You know, like, to, like a system like this is a setup for big trouble, and that's why those wars were fought, and yet we acquiesce to it now. Now, uh, the, the, the current response is to try to use law to correct it. So you have uh, uh, bureaucrats in Brussels and elsewhere gather to say, well, what should the rules be about this data? This is, this is, I can't tell you how techies laugh at this process because the idea that bureaucrats can foresee what programmers will do with anything remotely like the speed of programmers as they do it is just so absurd. It's just laughable. They will never keep up. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, and I could go into some examples of why, but it's, it's, just, it's, it's just not, the law is not agile or powerful enough almost by definition to address this issue. However, a combination of law and commerce would. So if as information is gathered about you because you're walking about, the government has to spend money on it, and they have a limited budget because they've had to argue for whatever tax rate they can, then they have to make decisions. And all of a sudden, a path of moderation appears. I think the idea, see, the thing about cloud software and big data and all this stuff is that it can bring incredible benefits if we could all get feedback about how our life choices are affecting our carbon footprint that might be a great thing. That might make a big difference to the climate, but that can only happen in the context. It has to be calculated as a whole. It can't be just person by person. And yet, right now, to give up that data would be to, um, to feed into this scheme. But in a commercial sense, it could be moderated. And, and, and uh, anyway, so, so um, part of, I'm sorry, I'm going on. No, 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 but, but um, I mean, I think, yeah. I, I think I, I'd say like, if you could explain a bit more about how that, that system of exchange yeah. would work, so that how, so, how people would be compensated okay. for. Okay, so, so um, another, another thing is, um, oh boy, going back to the origins of networking, the very first idea for, compu for network media and for network expression and for mashups and all these things that we are familiar with right now, goes back to 1960. Uh, the first, I, so far as I know, there's no dispute that the first person to articulate this stuff was Ted Nelson. And at the time, he, uh, or at least when I first met him, which was in the 70s, he was explicitly talking about trying to avoid some sort of Luddite-like uh, future, the idea to, so that it, to find a way to, for money, for information to be monetized as information technology would eventually take over the economy so that there could be an economy. And, um, a number of the principles, I'll just, I'll just go over a little bit about what an Elsonian network would be like, which is different from what we're used to. Um, one thing is you don't copy stuff. So this is such a weird concept. In the early days of networking, one of the things that we used to love about it was that you don't need to make copies anymore because the original is still there because it's a network. And um, the whole idea of copying is sort of bogus on a network. Uh, and so if this doesn't immediately make sense to you, uh, think about the phone in your pocket. You download apps for it. And if the app is updated by the developer, yours updates. So it's more like a mirror than a copy, right? So that's, that's the way it was always supposed to be. And the reason copies came about is just so bizarre. But um, the, the, a really influential uh, computer science lab was called Xerox Park. And Xerox Park is where Ethernet was invented, which is the way your phones are talking to Wi-Fi right now. And it's also where the modern feeling of computers were invented. The idea of, of graphical interfaces and all that stuff came from Xerox Park. And it was sponsored by Xerox, which was the preeminent copying machine company. And so um, I remember being there when I was quite young and, and, and all this stuff was happening. And, I, and we would whisper, like, oh, it's such a shame we have to include copying in this software, but otherwise we'll freak out our sponsors. So the very idea of copying on a network, which is technically absurd, was really part of pleasing a sponsor, which ended up not benefiting from the research, because I think we were too afraid to tell them what was really going on. 
Um, <clears throat> so, so there's no need for copy. So you don't impose this artificial idea of copying because it's, it's stupid. Doesn't um, copying have quite an important history in, in culture in terms, of, in terms of the preservation of culture? Does it, wouldn't the kind of absence of copies you know, defeat one of the sort of primary advantages of the internet as we have it now, that, that it's resilient, that copies of things are saved? I, mean, I just remember there's a lovely line in your book where you talk about this kind of transition that we'd have to make to the system, uh, where you say that, you know, we lost Rome, but, you know, the Renaissance did kind of turn up eventually. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that whole process happened because we preserved copies of things in multiple states. And yeah, no, no, no. A copy-free copy network is vastly more durable than a copy network. I mean, um, so, so, uh, so, here, so here's how it works. Um, the very idea of not needing copies was actually born on the same day, as I understand it, as the idea of the mashup itself. So here, here's how it would work. Um, let's say somebody's made something, I don't know, a video or something, and they post it. And now people access it, and somebody wants to mash it up. They want to take a clip and mash it into something else. So they have a reference link to the thing, and it's a bi-directional link so that the original knows it's been linked to, and the person who made the original knows that the thing's being used. And now, uh, their new video has a link back to the original, and then there can be a derivative video of that one that now has a link back to the original mashup, and it can get as mashed as mashed as it likes, and there's bi-directional links explaining the history of how the whole thing came together. If you like a little bit like the history on a Wikipedia page, but a little bit more detailed and structural. And now the beauty of this, there, there are many, many wonderful things about this. One thing is that meaning is only meaning in context. There's no such thing as absolute meaning. Uh, well, I don't think we can argue that, that if you want, but, but um, I, if they're philosophers, that is. But anyway, just, just as a rough cut, if we can agree that knowing the context of something helps, helps understand what it is. So in this case, the context is preserved. So we have better preservation. Um, there's a balance of rights of the masher and the mashed. So if somebody wants to represent something in a, a way that misrepresents it, like maybe it's a clip of a politician that's selecting just a little bit that creates a misimpression, the, 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 the link to the original is right there, so it becomes much harder to do. And because of these bi-directional links, we can set up an economic scheme so that micro payments can, can continue to benefit everybody in the long chain of mashupness. And so everybody gains an uh, a, a incentive to keep the thing going. So there, there are an enormous number of advantages. And bidirectional links are sort of like a double book accounting. They actually create a much more robust network. So it actually is better at preserving. It, it preserves context as well as just content, which becomes more and more meaningless with time. And it, it, uh, and it identifies content with people who are the actual people are the entities that matter, not the bits. So on, on many levels, it's, more, it's both more durable and more functional. It's also more efficient in the, in the large scale. I mean, um, what we're doing now is a massive, I mean, the carbon footprint of the internet, I've tried to estimate it, but it's, it's magnitudes worse than it needs to be because of all the copies and all the lost context that has to be recovered. I mean, consider what Google does for a living mostly is recover the backward links that were thrown away to figure out where things came from. What Facebook does is figure out who's looking at other people and that would also, like all of this effort, all of this scraping of the net all the time is actually unneeded. So it's this giant act of waste and stupidity. It's, it's, it's a profoundly dumb thing that we're doing. Um, if, if it's a <laughs> profoundly dumb thing that we're doing, yeah. um, and, and, and that there are technological <laughs> solutions yeah. to it, um, who can who can achieve those technological solutions? Like on who, on whom does the burden lie to to change this? Is this something that kind of that anyone can achieve? That governments can achieve, or is it something that remains entirely the preserves of technologists? To yeah. Fix? So, um, so here there's two different questions. Uh, well, there's so there's three questions raised in the book. One is is my diagnosis of a problem here the correct diagnosis? That can be argued. The second is a proposal of a solution, and I I go into quite a bit of detail, but I also make it clear that I can't pretend to know everything in advance. It has to be approached empirically, but there's a question of what the solution is right. And then the very hardest one is, what's a transition like? What, how does it work? So in the book, I outline a variety of different scenarios that could get us there. I will say, of, among people who are aware of these ideas are many who are thinking about the solution, and I, or a solution, and I, I get emails every day, multiple emails from people who have a scheme. And a, a lot of people want a scheme that can create a transition magically fast. 
like in the way that something like a Facebook rises quickly or Bitcoin or Kickstarter or something. So they want some kind of thing that feels like a Ponzi scheme at first that everybody wants to jump, in, jump into. And then at the end of it is this more sensible expanding information economy. I've never seen one of those that I think would work, but maybe somebody can do it. Um, I tend to prefer more deliberative, sort of slow approaches so that we can learn as we're going and we don't make another huge mistake. <laughs> and so I propose a sort of a spiraling back and forth over a couple of decades, maybe more, of uh, politics and technical people working together to gradually steer it, um, even though I realize that might be an overly adult way to approach the problem. but. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's the more sensible one. I mean, I think we have some time. This is not like this imminent catastrophe. It becomes a catastrophe when automation becomes very good. It's maybe like 20 years or something like that. Um, yeah, you've, you've, meant, you've mentioned yeah. automation being this kind of coming threat, and you've you said how it, how it affects people now, particularly who are performing kind of creative work and mm -hmm. so on. Um, but also, I, I can see how your, your kind of uh, iterative system of, of rewarding people backwards over time uh, for, for earlier contributions to an information economy works for people who, who contribute uh, creatively to that network. Um, what happens to people who, who aren't creating content? If the whole thing is transferred to an, an entirely information-based economy, okay. what's the rest of the economy? All right, so um, there's a couple things to say about this. We're used to a sort of a, um, a very constricted idea of what an information economy can be because the information economies we've experienced are all sort of these tree-shaped things that feed up to one of the giant siren servers, like an Amazon store or something like that, or an Apple store. And in those cases, you get, as I was saying, you get this distribution of people who benefit with a, a very thin, tall peak and then a long tail and not much in between. Um, now, there's another kind of network we're all familiar with where people's contact with each other's information uh, is much richer and generates more of a bell curve distribution if you were to monetize it, and that's a social network. So the unmonetized part of, say, of, of Facebook, say, where you connect with each other, or Twitter, um, if you look at the distribution of what people do with each other in the information space, and if, you were, if people were getting paid for that, it would create a bell curve, and that would create a middle class. And so that's where we find hope, is, is, is turning, you know, information economy into more of this graph webby kind of thing instead of the, instead of a tree that feeds to a master node. Now, in the context of doing that, what will happen is uh, th there'll be, <laughs> there'll still be stars, but it's just that the, the, the in-between mass, the bump in the middle, will be able to outspend them so that an elite won't take over the society. I mean, that's, that's what you get for that. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't have the, the, the downside of the curve, too, of people who make less than average and much less than average. And so um, what you want is to have as few people who do really badly in the information economy as you can, or they should be about the same as the number of elites, you know, sort of you want a symmetrical bell curve. Um, and then for, the, for people on the bad side of the bell curve, the information economy, economy, um, there are two things that can happen. One is they can do well in the physical economy, which I don't think will go away completely. So um, I think it's very unlikely that the information economy becomes everything. I mean, presumably there will be things that software and robots don't do. Um, we don't know exactly what they are. I mean, there's, I have many friends who believe that your massage will come from the ideal robot massager in the future. Um, and uh, I describe in the book how, well, it gets really nutty. There's some people who think that, that, that you know, nobody would be foolish to have anything but a robotic sex partner in the future when they're better than people or whatever. You know? Uh, you know, I make fun of some of this stuff. But anyway, it, it's not important for us to know exactly what can't be automated yet. The point is that it, it's very unlikely that everything will be automated. So there should be a physical economy. And many of the people who might be on the downside of the curve of the information economy might find, might find success in physicality. Um, and here we, here we hit a dilemma that I don't know how to solve. We hit a tragedy that no one's been able to solve, which is that if you want to have a society in which there isn't an elite that gains power, you have to have some sort of bell curve where the middle has the power and outspends the elite. But if you have that, then there's some kind of a down, a, the, the low end of that curve, which is some, the poor or something like that, the people who don't do as well. And I, I don't know how to disempower an elite without also creating that because that's how statistics work, that's how math works. And so, so there has to be social services, I think, in a future in which most people have liberty. And, and, and that's, 
those are fighting words in the US where people are sort of super libertarian and Ayn Rand oriented these days, but I, I just think the math supports that idea. So I think you need to have some form of liberalism to make an information economy work in the future. And um, so but the, 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 the main solution you're proposing or that you uh -huh. propose in the book for this, um, uh, that's very much based on this idea of two-way linking and always attributing context and therefore being able to funnel uh, kind of financial transactions through that to kind of support uh, all kinds of work, everyday work as well as creative work. Um, it, it, it feels like an expansion of the very technological kind of dominance that you're critiquing in the book, that you say that we, we've ended up with the system that we have now through very unforeseen, um, uh, unforeseen outcomes from technologies that we didn't see coming. Yeah. And, and your solution is to essentially expand the technological right. overview of, of the world. <laughs> Yeah, that's the human condition. The human condition is we make our way and we try to get better at it, but every time we do something to try to influence our own fate because we're these mysteriously free creatures, we, there are side effects because we're not perfect and then we have to undo those side effects and that's what technology is. Technology is always undoing the last thing you did because you screwed up, you know, I mean, that's what it is. And, and it's, a, it's, a game, it's a game we entered into leaving the Garden of Eden, if you like. It's a game that's mandatory for us. We can't escape it at this point. Um, I get frustrated with it sometimes, even though I love technology. I sort of wish I could get off the, the ride once in a while. Um, but it's it's our fate now. It's what we got. And uh, uh, it's, it's scary, you know, because, um, you know, every disease cured is a new poison or biological weapon in the making. Every new source of nutrition is a famine in the making, potentially. That's what Malthus pointed out. Every, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have to learn to get better and better at not screwing ourselves over as we get more capable in general. And it sucks, but that's what we got to do. We have to grow up. It's hard. Um, we're going to go to the Q and A in a minute. I think you wanted to play a, oh, play yeah. a bit more, but can I ask one more? Oh, yeah, one sure, more sort sure, of sure. So we, we've identified that there's a, uh, a huge a problem, there's an issue here, which is based on the kind of technological foundations, the way we've built things. Um, and there are potential ways to, to change that as well, um, that we could re-architect. Um, that still feels like something that's very much the, the domain of, of technologists, of people who, who can read and act in those systems for themselves. Um, before, before we go to q and I'd, I'd love to know some kind of things that... that the, people, every, everyone can do to, to slightly uh, say, change the course of this, to, to address this themselves and kind of, and I, these are long-term problems, but there must be short-term approaches yeah, to deal with Yeah, I do have some recommendations about that. So, um, one thing I want to recommend is to become as aware as possible of how you fit into other people's computation schemes. So all of us are being tracked by dozens of gigantic hidden computers now. Um, all of us are being characterized by dozens of dossiers that will really influence us, that will determine whether we get credit, who we'll meet to date, it, uh, uh, where we'll be employed, uh, you know. And so, uh, and, and, and these, like I said, these, these big computers that have these dossiers are sometimes uh, held by private companies, sometimes by national intelligence agencies, uh, sometimes they're in banks or, other, or financial schemes of one sort or another. Um, I, I think the one thing to do is instead of freaking out and going anti and saying, oh, those techies are terrible, um, I think experimenting with your own life by severing ties with different servers from time to time and seeing what happens is one, gate, is one way to regain some autonomy and also just to screw with the technologists a little bit. And, uh, and so, uh, so and, and it doesn't have to involve deep judgments or something. So like, um, let's say you're in a situation where a particular service of Facebook or Twitter seems essential to you well, you know, it, it depends where you are in life. I mean, if it really is and it'll, it'll do harm then it, to, to not use it, then keep using it. But if you're young enough to be experimental, just like you might want to go hitchhiking in some part of the world that's less developed to just know yourself and know the world directly, a very simple thing to do is go off it for six months. Just try it. Just, just sever. Go off it, not judging, not saying that anybody else should do it, not saying that you'll never go back on it, not, not uh, being a moralist about it, but simply as an experimentalist, stop using it for a while. Um, 
If you want to play the technical game of trying to hide from the servers and trying to get better, you can read about that. There are all kinds of little extra, like you can get plugins for your browser that'll block ads and trackers and that. But you have to be vigilant. I mean, that, that requires a lot of work. I mean, even just setting privacy settings in Facebook is, is something most people can't do, really. Um, and, and no, seriously, I mean, and, and, and so, you, you know, it'll, that takes some work. Um, there's nothing you can do that's easy, you know. I mean, if there's somebody, if there's something where somebody says, "Oh, you know, to get out from under this regime, um, tweet this or you know, forward this movie to people." I mean, if it's really easy, it's not doing anything. I mean, just get used to that. All right. Uh, <laughs> Aren't those approaches, though, kind of exactly what would be uh -huh. impossible in a more pervasive technological system like the one that you propose as the kind of next step? For, mm -hmm. for kind of freedom in this. If, 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 if everything that we do, if every action, if every contribution is kind of tracked, monitored, surveilled, and, and, and put it within a kind of capitalist framework of reward, doesn't the, the salute, the, that, that approach of cutting yourself off become completely impossible? Well, until we change the system. No, I mean, this is the problem. So right now, we face these all or nothing choices. For instance, you know, this idea of wearing a little display over your eye and seeing extra stuff in the world. Uh, well, I invented that, you know, and I built the first one of those and blah, 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 you know, years ago. And now Google wants to bring out their thing, Google Glass, and I'm, and the, a lot of the people on it were from my old startup, and I, I, I like them, you know, and I, I want them to be successful, but the problem is that to use it at all, you'll have to, or so far as I know, you'll have to sign up for Google stuff, you know, and all the information will be logged from right on your face, what you're seeing, you know, and uh, the, the, the choice of having to either get something like that uh, and submit to, acquiesce to being tracked all the time on this very intimate level or not. I mean, it's a crazy choice. And what you should really have the choice of doing is, yeah, you can track me, but it's going to cost you. And then you set your price and then you decide how much you want to be tracked by that price. And if they really, you know, and you can, if you set it high enough, you won't be tracked. And most people will probably end up somewhere in between because there's some value in it, but it'll create moderation. Uh, that, that's the way out. And on that note, thank you. Um, would you On that like note, to yes. Okay, so um, I, I have uh, three more instruments, and I'll play one before questions, and then one or two after questions. Uh, there's an electric oud, a uh, Middle Eastern <laughs> instrument. There's a weird double flute thing that has no name that I got from some Hungarian gypsy kids that's really cool, that's not, not documented anywhere. I, I don't know what it is. And I have a Japanese shakuhachi flute. Which do you want? Uh, oud, let me hear. Uh, double Hungarian flute from the gypsies. Shakuhachi. All right, double flute. All right, so then we'll do. So then I'll do one of the other ones later. So this was. Um, I saw some kids doing this in a train station, and they, one was one was playing these to distract people, because it is kind of mysterious that it works at all, and then the other was picking their pockets. <laughs> And um, the, uh, the, uh, if you see only one of these at a time, that's a pretty well-known instrument, but the pair together has a special trick, and I'm not aware of it being documented or named anywhere. Okay. So, questions. So, yeah, we're going to take some questions. If you uh, over here, I think we'll start and wait for the mic so we can all hear. That'd be great. 
Hello there. I'd like to talk about um, human consciousness. So you talked about the music industry, for example. Everything was, you know, in about 1995, we saw the internet coming, things started getting free, Napster and so on turned up in 99. We thought it was going to be good. You're saying it was probably bad. Apple came along in 2003 with iTunes and the rest is history. It's the largest distributor of, of mm -hmm, music mm -hmm. by a long way. So what happens with education? We're now looking at digital learning, MOOCs, Khan Academy, all this kind of stuff coming along, um, Harvard, MIT, and so on, all trying to get in there, a bit like the old record labels. Yeah. You know, if, the, if education isn't free, it's not available, what happens when another Death Star comes in and owns education, <laughs> owns the content, owns the assessment? Isn't that human consciousness? Yeah. Um... Okay, so um, this idea of, of leveraging the internet to make education more accessible to large numbers of people was one of the core ideals of the internet from its very birth. And I, I worked very hard myself on, all, on schemes like this, and obviously it's essential, and, and one would have to be cruel to not want to see something happen. And yet, under the current scheme of information being free, it you know, it'll bring in initial benefits to a, a lucky token few, just like the other digital transitions do, but then remove opportunity from large numbers of others. I mean, this hit me really strong when I, you know, I remember looking at these really bright young folks in Tahrir Square who had, uh, in part used mobile phones and, and the internet to, to help organize a revolution that at that time at least was uh, relatively painless and, and peaceful, relatively, you know, compared to many historically. We'll see where it goes now. But at any rate, I remember looking at them and thinking, wow, this is so great. And maybe the technology helped a little bit, but, um, you know, where, what, are, what are their jobs gonna be? What are they gonna do? What are their, what are their life prospects, you know? Where, you know, and you try to imagine how this technology is really going to play into helping them build lives, build families, build some, build a base, build some momentum, build something that's solid to get out of the informal economy and into a formal economy, and it's just not going to happen. So, you know, um, the problem I have is that we could rapidly create a lot of of educated, underutilized, underemployed people around the world, which who would be very frustrated, and that would be, and, and that's what I'm. That's what I feel we're doing. So. Um, I'm all for making technology more accessible, of course, what a lovely thing. And yet, if we don't also make wealth and, sust and, and sustenance and, and an ability to enter a formal economy that's a fair economy with a middle class that can sustain a democracy, if we don't do those things at the same time, we're just offering a cruel tease and we're, we're screwing over those people. So we have, to, we have to do the whole thing. We can't just do a little part of it. So thank you very much. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I guess I was interested to hear what are your thoughts on kind of seeing the digital and the physical as different? I guess, namely, I'm thinking about digital dualism. And, you know, earlier, kind of when you started your talk, you said something along the lines of, I came to realize we blew it. Not all computers are created equal. And then you, I think, talked about, you know, whether or not it was new. So maybe you could elaborate on that and how the two interrelate. Okay. Um, all right. So a computer is um, a little pocket of the world, a little, a little, you draw a box around a piece of the world, and then you manipulate it um, so that it's deterministic and predictable. Um, you, you create a little local, local area where thermodynamics doesn't apply, where that's not entropic, where information isn't lost, and all the bits work perfectly. And in order to do that, you radiate waste heat and randomness into the, the rest of the world, so overall, there's no free lunch, just like I was talking about Maxwell's demon. So every every computer is exact, every bit's a Maxwell's demon, you know, that can only run for a while and at the expense of increasing entropy in the rest of the world. So, um, uh, so you know, the um, this this idea of a computer uh, cannot be reality because reality cannot absorb the waste heat from all the computers. They they are they're fundamentally different, or else there would be a free lunch. And so you, you have to look at computation fundamentally and you can see that it's a local illusion that's created. Now then another layer to ask about is why did the bits have any meaning at all? You know, um, like uh, you could have two computers that do the same thing that were specified by different programs, for instance. So there's no there's no single implied meaning to any set of bits. And um, if you want to get you know to really get into this in detail, I, I go into it um, a little bit in this book, but more in the previous book. And you are not a gadget. Um, with there's a thought experiment about an infinite computer store where you take an arbitrary string of bits and then you search through this big computer store to find one that makes it operate as any 
arbitrary program, you know? And you start to see that there's a kind of a, uh, there's a, there's a weird thing about computers where there has to be some external force that imposes meaning on the bits. And, and, uh, and so, so intrinsic to the idea of computation is a kind of a dualism. Now, whether dualism is right or not ultimately is a different question, but the very idea of computation has embedded in it the idea that people are different from ordinary mechanism because we impose the, the meaning and, and create this, this the, we're able to perceive this local violation of thermodynamics and all that. So there's, there's actually a, an almost mystical dualism implied in the very idea of computation to begin with. Um, this, is an, this was actually, this is embedded in the idea of the Turing test even because it's a person who's the judge of whether the Turing test has been passed. And, and, you know, and, and that, that's the problem is that it's a circular thing. It always comes down to people judging. So, so just to answer your question, yeah, I think people are mystical and different from matter, but in particular different from computers. And I, and I think that, not because I know it absolutely, but, but because pragmatically it's the only way to think that allows me to be an effective computer scientist. How does that um, that separation of, of humanity and, and computers is that, uh, that that it's necessary for uh, human involvement to kind of give meaning to the technosphere? How does that relate to the um, the idea that we can kind of impose a better humanistic um, relationships between people through better uses of technology itself? No, technology can't make people better, and it can't make really relation. Like the way I think of it is. Um, uh, maybe there's a fine line distinguishing these things, but what I want to do is not have technology make things worse between people. Um, I feel like only people can make things better, but I think technology can make things worse. And I can go into a bit more detail about that. I think um, in the human psyche, uh, there's sort of a, a, what I call a clan switch. I, I think we evolved to be able to be either uh, uh, singleton roamers or members of a clan and when you have a computer network that's designed to invoke clan membership um, then people kind of can align themselves like like uh, photons in a laser and, and become sort of unified and that's what happens when things go viral and stuff and it can happen very rapidly and if it's about a cat video no harm done um, if it's about a political idea or dumping on some group or something it's it's fascism you know and I'm, I really am afraid we're playing with fire and I think we um, we see little outbreaks of mean stuff online all the time, and the problem is, could there be a big one? Yeah, there could be, and, and I, I, it concerns me. Um, and uh, the, you know, uh, the point, so um, getting back to you know the monetized network, that's a graph instead of a tree that I was describing, I believe for many reasons would create more diversity of points of view and would be less likely to turn that clan switch. Uh, I'll try, I, I, I'm, I would like to try and understand a bit more about the argument that you make, you distinguish between a mirrored network and a copy network, right? So a mirrored network um, which, in which information is shared, I guess, uh, in a way that preserves an original, and a copy network in which the original is effectively destroyed, everything becomes copies. And, and if I've understood that, then the question I'd like to ask is about, has to do with abundance. You know, copy shares the same root term as copious, right? Abundance. And part of the argument about, I guess, a copy-based network is that it, it enables abundance. Now, my question is this. Is, are you arguing that, the, that your idea of a mirror network, or Nelson's idea of a mirror network, could end up creating more abundance? And are you kind of arguing that, that, that the copy-based network that we've become used to uh, we think that there's a great deal of abundance, but it's at the expense of people like creators getting screwed because they can't get paid for the work that they yeah. do. Yeah. It's not really as abundant as we're led to believe. Just to repeat what the gentleman said okay. for the benefit of the machines. Um, uh, the gentleman asked if the... Um, if this uh, description of the, the mirror network, uh, where you can re reach out and reach the single copy versus a network where you copy everything, uh, if that produces, that produces the illusion of abundance, the continuous copying, but it's actually kind of shrinking the network as a whole. Well, it shrinks the economy. So, you know, um, the, the more uh, information, the more the information economy becomes dominant as automation gets better, the economy will expand if information is monetized and it'll contract if information is not monetized. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is just a very simple thing. For instance, in, in Silicon Valley, 
it's a common thing for venture capital firms to advertise that they will only invest in a, uh, a net startup that will shrink markets. Because it's when you shrink markets that you're gathering the power, you're, you're getting rid of what had been monetized, which is other people having wealth and you're concentrating it in your server. So the idea is that you're shrinking the market. We're doing that to the overall economy. So the, the copy-oriented network is precisely the opposite of abundance. And the, the longer it goes into the future, the less abundance there'll be. Um, and uh, the mirror network is, um, uh, the, the primary difference is the backward link. The, the idea is that every p information has a context. It, it, it remembers where it came from. Um, and uh, that small change makes a huge difference because it does allow for monetization. It does put information in context and it ties information to the people who made it. So it's about the people instead of the bits. And so that's the true path to abundance. Yes, so yes, you've been lied to. You've been sold a bill of goods. I'm sorry, I helped do it. Uh, you, you describe it in the book frequently as, as essentially a, what you're proposing is a, a more honest accounting. Uh, well, yeah. that really takes everything into it. Well, I mean, to, to put it in its most brutal terms, the very idea of artificial intelligence being able to do something a person can do online, like translate, is exactly and precisely an act of bad accounting. It's an act of forgetting to account for where the value came from. Thank you. The gentleman down here has hands since the beginning. Um, a, a lot of what you've talked about, and I, I appreciate, I'm, I'm a cyberneticist, I, I appreciate your entropic value perception and your, your uh -huh. Maxwell's demons uh, alignment. Um, but a lot of what you talk about seems to promote the fact that there is no positive sum uh, economy there. It's always zero sum economy or a negative sum economy in the machine world. When you, when you contribute, you have to trade one thing against another. Uh, am I understanding correctly that you really don't think there is a positive sum economy there in the, the machine network? Well, what I'm saying is that the machine network is a negative sum economy where the success for the few shrinks the market overall. So I'm, I'm arguing that it's a shrinking, that the machine economy is a shrinking economy, if you like, and what I'd rather see is a growing economy. I'm not, I'm not saying it's zero sum, I'm saying it's worse than zero sum. And explicitly so. I mean, that's what we say when we create startups. That's our logic for deciding which startups to fund. So this is not like some, I'm not applying some avant-garde, you know, radical interpretation. I'm actually describing the language we use ourselves in how we act. It's, it's actually conventional. Will, in emergent, uh, will intelligence emerge from, from all of this data? And will the internet become intelligent? The, as, as the Turing test teaches us, the only sense in which intelligence can emerge is if we believe it has emerged. And the problem is we can't tell the degree to which we've made ourselves into idiots in order to make the, have that perception. <laughs> so therefore, we don't have the empirical basis. We don't have a privileged enough position to answer that question. We can only rely on pragmatic considerations to decide. And those who think that the internet can come alive are planning um, a disruption in our collective memory and in our way of doing things that they call the singularity, which would be highly destructive and really stupid, but there will never be any resolution about whether our machines become intelligent. It's always a matter of faith, just as it is between people. So, I think we've got time for, do you think one more question? Yes, certainly. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I'm interested in the enforcement of the kind of monetized network as you talk about how, um, when, in order to transfer something on a network, you have to copy it. How do you enforce um, these money flows? And given you know, every, all the history we've seen of how copy protection schemes work, in order to give people the means to view something, you have to give them the keys to unlock it. And those are almost always broken. If they haven't been broken already, they mm. will be in the future. Yeah, sure. Okay, first of all, um I, I'm trying not to be too technical in this talk, so one has to make a distinction between uh, logical copies, and, and so what I'm saying is there don't need to be any logical copies. Obviously, as a matter of implementation, there have to be copies, there have to be local caches and blah, 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 just for performance and backup and all that. So um, that, that has to be made clear. So there's not, there's not a, um, 
there's not like sort of an injunction on moving bits somewhere because <laughs> it is a network, you know, but there is an injunction on logical copies. And then um, in terms of the security issue, um, I think ultimately there's no such thing as an airtight system. I mean, um, and if you want to see some people trying to build something like that, you could look at Bitcoin, for instance, where there have been some scandals and some, and some problems. Um, and uh, I think you can make a pretty good system. I think we could do better than Bitcoin. Maybe we can do twice as good or something, you know, and, and reduce the occurrences of, 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 of security holes in it. But that can't be the central point. I mean, what has to happen is a social network where most people see a value in it and want to follow it. And then the exceptions can be a matter for hackers and law enforcement to deal with. But they ha the exceptions have to be small. The only way for society to work, is all as if, it, it, the, for, to work at all is if the majority of people feel that the system is worth working with. In, right, so um, it's not that hard to go and break into apartments and cars and steal them. I mean, I'm sure many people in this audience have the skills to do it. If I know my audiences, and um, uh, the reason we don't go out and do that is we like living in a world where cars and homes aren't broken into very much, right? And so that's a social contract that has to take hold digitally. We can't try to rely on some perfect security system. We can have we can have a good one, so that because there'll always be. Um, some of the, I've known some criminals who estimate that 5% uh, of the population is criminal. You know, that's a, that's a number that one runs across in, 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 in uh, criminology circles as well. So let's say it has to be good enough that for the one out of 20 people who are just not going to like anything, um, it's at least a little hard and some number of them are catchable and overall the thing works. But, to, but, but trying to chase the perfect security system, of course, is impossible. Like the perfect password can't be remembered. You know, that's just, that's just the way it is. You can, you can never quite get there. And on the note of the social contract, we've agreed to give time for book signings and so on after this. So I think that's the last question, but you would ask to play one more piece for us before we... Yeah, before sure, we I'll, I'll, play, I'll play a couple more minutes. Um, um, Ud Shakuhachi, I don't know. Both? I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do them at the same time. Uh, is this on? Um, you all know what an oud is, right? Do I need to introduce the oud? This is my electric oud, which is, I can travel without getting messed up, and it's, it's at least tolerable. Uh, please give it up for Jaranani and James Bryden.